everyone. I'm so happy that so many people came this evening um, under such exciting and uh, different circumstances. But I'm very happy to introduce Brian Hutzbaut, or Hutz as most of us know him. He is a designer, maker, and educator. His work is influenced by influence and informed around the relationships, the connections to objects we make and use, the environments in which we are immersed, collaborations between humans, and the dissonance between the built and the unbuilt world. Hutt's foundation in graphic design heavily influences his aesthetic and functional decisions revealed in his sculptural and socially engaging work. Through traditional craft practices, he reacts to his immediate surroundings by utilizing found materials to reposition the value of the discarded object. Hutz received a BFA in graphic design from Georgia Southern University in 2006 and completed his MFA in applied craft design from Pacific Northwest College of Art in 2014, where he received the highest award recognition from the Applied Craft and Design Program. He has shown his work in galleries throughout the southeastern and western United States and also in Bayeux, France. In 2014, he was awarded an artist in residency at Leland Ironworks, and in 2015, he has shown works at Destructa Contemporary Art Center in Portland, Oregon, as part of the Glean Residency. He currently has work on display through 2021 in the outdoor exhibition at the Napa Artwork, Art Walk, the Napa Art Walk in California, and he has just installed a piece that will be on display in Howard Park for two years. So we can go and see that online, um, right here in South Bend. Hutz has taught classes at St. Mary's College. Here at South Bend, we are very fortunate to have his expertise and creativity as a visiting professor for Dora Nutella, who is on leave from the finance department. Please join me in a warm welcome for Hutz. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Does it seem like it's on? Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, uh, as Susan mentioned, my uh, undergrad degree is in graphic design. And while I think that it influences my work, um, and I still do design today, I, at heart I still think that I'm more of a maker, uh, a tinkerer, a fixer, uh, a problem solver, and a sculptor. Uh, during my talk today, what I'd like to do is uh, share with you who I am as an artist and how I got here. Ooh, that sounds nice. Um, so some of you may have heard part of this story, uh, uh, how I transitioned between the two-dimensional realm into uh, the 3D world. Ooh, it's back up. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'll just keep going, see what happens. Um, and so, uh, for the most part, this, uh, what I'd like to focus on with this lecture is, is how I made that transition from 2D to 3D. Um, and I think to kind of start it off, uh, when I did graphic design, I took uh, one sculpture class in undergrad, and it was my senior year of uh, college that I discovered this. Uh, and. Uh, of course, at being a, at the senior year of my uh, college collegiate career, uh, I didn't really think to, that that was I had any future in that at the time. Uh, it was uh, really interesting to work with my hands and to to uh, problem solve in that way. Um, but I, I, you know, I was graduating with graphic design, so. Uh, but because I took that one class, I just kind of kept it on the back burner uh, as some some interest maybe in the future of mine. Um, and so, uh, essentially what I eventually um, started to, to do, once I got a, a degree in graphic design, I got into the uh, field doing uh, design work for an ad agency. 
And um, at some point, I realized that I still wanted to figure out a way to work with my hands. Um, you know, being on the computer um, for quite some time, I, I needed another outlet. Uh, and so I started to explore other opportunities. And I, I really thought back into that uh, realm of the 3D making, into sculpture, and thought, well, maybe I can pursue this into in more of a, uh, in like a graduate degree program. Uh, of course, all my work in, uh, uh, in my undergraduate portfolio was all two-dimensional, so I wasn't really able to uh, apply to a, a program doing sculpture. So I spent uh, approximately two years building a portfolio uh, to then help me get into grad school for sculpture. Um, and so uh, part of this, I'll start off by talking about some of that work. Um, so this piece, uh, this piece is called Colony. And um, I think it was probably the, the first time that I saw um, where there was this, um, I, I had more of a message, more of a voice in, in the things I was making. Um, and when I, took, uh, when I took that one sculpture class back in uh, undergrad, what really um, amazed me about working three-dimensionally is that it was it was the only form of art that I knew that I could actually physically get people to move. Uh, it was actually to physically change their motion. And so that was the first thing that I kind of stuck with in, in, in this independent study. And then as I kind of progressed build, uh, doing other pieces, then I kind of got to know more about uh, what, my, what my actual uh, uh, interests were. So uh, I was working at REI at the time. Uh, which is Recreational Equipment Incorporated. They, they sell a lot of outdoor equipment. And um, there's this really weird collision that happened between this um, consumerism of uh, these outdoor-related uh, equipment, but then at the same time, uh, you know, there's this, this uh, kind of uh, stewardship to the outdoors. And being in there and kind of seeing all the packaging that came through and uh, being uh, exposed to that made me really start to think about that uh, consumerism of the products to then enjoy the nature. And uh, one thing that happened while I was working there is there were all these um, uh, clothing that we got in, in the store uh, were all covered with uh, plastic. They were all wrapped before we actually put them out onto the sales floor. And uh, it was quite odd. Some, some companies did that, some other companies didn't, and I learned that uh, through transportation, they were cranking out so many uh, garments uh, that uh, they didn't give them enough time for the dye to set in, and so they wrapped them in plastic as a means of sh being able to ship them out faster, and uh, so they wouldn't bleed into each other. And so we got all this plastic, it wasn't recyclable. And so it was just piling up, and, uh, and the store just kind of started filling with this plastic in the back. And uh, being in that space, I was really inspired to work with the material. So I, this piece, I was really um, thinking about our connection to uh, the materials that we use uh, and the products that we we're using on a daily basis, and kind of how that's affecting, um, affecting, literally affecting nature. And so I was uh, binding and wrapping these pieces. Uh, almost in sort of like these pod-like forms. Um, another piece that was kind of a turning point as well, uh, apart from this piece, uh, is this one. This is called Compound Horizon. And um, I, while I was also working at REI and, and doing my independent study, um, I, I was, <laughs> as a, uh, a um, college student or, or recently graduated college student, uh, I went to the Goodwill bins for inspiration. The Goodwill bins are a little bit different than uh, like a standard Goodwill store. It actually uh, has all things in there and you can buy it by the pound. Uh, so the more, and there's like an incentive to buy more stuff and the more stuff you buy, the cheaper it was. Uh, so I was really uh, inspired by what was happening up, uh, there and I noticed that this was all stuff that didn't make the cut at Goodwill. So stuff that people donated, and then stuff that people didn't even want to buy. And then this was all the sort of the leftover remains. 
and I started to notice how much clothing was there. So I was really inspired by the, the vast quantity of uh, cloth and, um, and its relationship to the human body as well. And I started to um, compress this in different ways, and I did a lot of pieces around compression and, and as a way to maybe sort of uh, minimize the amount of stuff. Uh, I also think that uh, this simultaneously had uh, kind of a, uh, a parallel to things seen in nature as well. Um, and as I was working in this way, um, a lot of that process, a lot of that art making was very much rooted in um, the action of the making, the physical, uh, the physical process. Uh, and that, I started really um, thinking about how that also had sort of a, a parallel to craft traditions. Um, the idea that uh, there's a lot of uh, intention in, in forming an object that's, uh, whether it's woven or it's carved out of wood. Um, and I really admired those craft traditions um, as, part of, as part of my practice, even though I wasn't quite doing uh, that in my practice. Uh, so in that uh, interest, I was looking for grad schools, and the, the grad school that sort of had that uh, that tie between uh, making uh, was the uh, Pacific Northwest College of Art in, in Portland, Oregon. And they had a very uh, specific program that was a joint program with uh, another college, the Oregon College of Art and Craft. Uh, and so my program was called the Applied Craft and Design Program. And it really highlighted on that connection and bridging the gap between uh, art and craft and design. Uh, so I, so I was uh, headed to the West Coast. Um, uh, the independent study I did in, in Nashville, um, so this was quite a, a change of scenery for me. Um, I, was, I was very much influenced by the, um, the very tall legless fir trees and uh, uh, the mountains that were out there as well. Um, I think that uh, with this interest of uh, working uh, with craft traditions, uh, something that was unique about this program is that they also had an interest of working with the community as well. And um, while I didn't quite know how that fit into my own practice, um, I realized that uh, perhaps there was a way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's not behaving. That's it's how not that was not correct. <laughs> So 
this particular design build, they change it every every year. Uh, was specifically uh, the goal was to specifically uh, create a uh, a bicycle repair hub for a North Portland neighborhood. And um, for this particular uh, neighborhood, it's a uh, a mixed income neighborhood. Uh, and although Portland is a very much uh, bike focused uh, town, there's probably more cyclists there uh, than anywhere else. I think there's always an argument between there and Minneapolis, but um, but still, with that being said, there weren't the resources for the uh, the people of this neighborhood to have access to uh, to bicycle repair, and uh, so they already had a, a really great um, community that was uh, pro cycling, uh, and they also had um, a lot of uh, education uh, in place regarding bike safety and awareness. Uh, but they just didn't have anywhere to get anything fixed if they, if they had a, uh, an issue with that. So, um, so as uh, this uh, team of, uh, of artists that came in, um, we were sort of tasked with creating, uh, designing, uh, and then also building uh, this bicycle repair hub. And uh, I think what's uh, unique about this as well is that we're not just uh, making something and hoping they like it. It was very much centered on working with a, a relationship and a dialogue between the community and what they need and what we're able to do. So we went through uh, the process of uh, doing uh, miniature models and uh, coming in with, up with ideas and, and uh, through uh, one week uh, uh, we were able to uh, kind of go back and forth and give them what they, uh, what they close to what they needed. And um, and then we got to work. We started uh, started building. Um, and I think what's really interesting about this uh, process for me uh, and how it relates to my work now as well is that it, it is really focused on um, working with others to create um, uh, a larger goal. And I think that um, uh, in regard to this as well is that there's something that, that uh, happened that was really unique. Um, we didn't... Uh, we didn't know each other before we started working on this. We all had different skill levels as well, so we had to sort of work with each other to see what uh, teams we could be on and what our expertise was. Um, and what was interesting is when we actually started the program, uh, there was there were other MFA programs that we um, all went to orientation with, and we already had been working with each other for two weeks, and we got to know each other really well. And the other programs were just starting. It was their day one, and they didn't know each other at all. And so beyond the fact that we built something for the community, we were also able to really build on our own relationship, which I think made us a really strong cohort in our graduate program. So I was really interested in this idea of, uh, of working in this way. It seemed like there was really um, nice results when working with the people around us, and creating some type of community, and also working with the with the actual uh, North Portland community as well. So I haven't actually watched this video probably in several years. So it's actually really nice to just kind of see the progress and um, remember remember the whole steps that we took to take to get it done. We also incorporated a, uh, there was like a sculptural aspect to it. There was some, there was a team that was doing furniture. There was a team that was on the concrete. So we all kind of had our own expertise. So I think one of the things about this idea of, that I learned kind of very early on is that um, I, I I was kind of fell in love with it, uh, you know, before I even knew too much about it and. Um, it really, uh, I really also started becoming really interested in this as a, um, as a platform for education. Uh, one of the reasons why I went to grad school for sculpture was so that I could potentially teach sculpture at, at the collegiate level. And uh, by seeing this uh, kind of as an example or as like a case study for what could happen, uh, I began to really look into this uh, later on in my uh, college uh, career to see how that would affect my own teaching philosophy. Um, and as I uh, was looking at this, one of the things that kind of struck me is that we did this really quickly. We, we, uh, you know, the relationship was already set up before we went into the, 
this neighborhood through some of the chairs and uh, program directors at the university. But as students, we kind of jump, jumped into it. Um, and then we finished it, and then all the students walked away. And I, that kind of really struck with me that we just kind of left it there, you know, left it to hopefully succeed. And um, so as, you know, as we were, you know, we finished the piece, uh, it, it completely functions. Um, and the, the, the community uh, embraced it and really uh, seemed to make it uh, their own. Uh, but we actually technically didn't finish it. Uh, those poles that are uh, upright are actually um, uh, supposed to have some type of canopy added to it, uh, which was never done. Um, and I, so I almost kind of felt this obligation of like, well, is there a way to, like, does the program have any relationship of, of that, uh, of what they do? Um, and they, they didn't at the time. So I kind of started to take an interest in the neighborhood myself just to kind of understand what is this, what does it mean when we make something and put it into the world? It might be sustainable as, a, as an object, but is it sustainable in the system? Uh, I later, uh, about a year later, I was uh, project lead for, they, they had like a two phase um, implementation of what they wanted to do in the neighborhood. And the second implementation was a bike skills park. So not only a uh, repair hub to fix bikes, but a, a safe place for, for kids in the neighborhood uh, to ride. So I was um, uh, able to be the project lead to make sure that that was developed. And this was kind of a, a way that I was able to really um, uh, understand what was going on in the community and, and sort of learn how that uh, education platform worked. Um, so as, a, as I continued to kind of uh, uh, progress in my program. This is about a year into it. I did a, a lot of digging <laughs> during this uh, project and actually this summer uh, I also worked with an artist, uh, his name is Thomas Sayer and uh, he's actually uh, I think out of Raleigh, North Carolina and he uh, does these uh, gigantic earth cast uh, sculptural pieces and I had the opportunity of working uh, on this project that was a, um, a partnership with the, uh, the city metro system and they were putting in uh, large sculptural pieces uh, with their mass transit. And so the process uh, basically was dig a ditch <laughs> and um, he had a team from, uh, from Raleigh that would come and put in a uh, uh, the rebar and then he would pour concrete into the cast earth. Uh, and then from that, uh, there's a mold that was uh, formed uh, and then once the concrete was hardened, then all the dirt could be uh, removed away and the entire uh, form is lifted up. Um, so this really interesting connection to uh, the earth and to making uh, and, and permanence, right? Um, and so I think that's really interesting. This is, the thing is we did it twice. We did one ditch and we built up this giant thing and we did it again. So both using uh, some larger machines as well, those giant drills and backhoes and things like that. Um, but I think what also I really appreciate about this experience relating also to my design build experiences, uh, regardless if the community is involved, there's, this also required a lot of teamwork as well to get the project done. And another thing I learned from Tom Sayer too is that you have to make your, uh, your working area very clean and don't leave a bunch of stuff around. Uh, you know, as artists, we already have kind of a bad rap going into this, so you don't want to give anybody any excuses to, to not appreciate what we do. So he, he very much ingrained that into, into my practice. Um, so the program has uh, essentially uh, a mentor-based relationship with, uh, um, a, uh, with a mentor. <laughs> Uh, and we got to choose our mentor each semester. And I was working uh, my first semester with this uh, woman, her name is Peg Butler, and she uh, was a part of this project. Uh, this, this project is called Deconstruction. And Decom is the neighborhood, uh, but she specifically uh, was commissioned, uh, and they worked with the neighborhood to create a, uh, a rain garden, uh, or a, essentially a bioswell, that uh, was focusing on uh, functional aspect of uh, offering a place for, to park bikes. It also um, 
filters through uh, potentially polluted rainwater before going into the river. And also they were adding a, a, a conceptual component as well. And you'll see that there's these uh, giant oil barrels that are on the, the piece. The oil barrels um, were also, they're essentially a reference to a lot of the oil spills that have happened in the Pacific. And they've uh, uh, included some of the names of those spills uh, on the barrel. What's interesting about Kerr uh, is that I also learned um, this uh, a little bit more about the relationship as, a, as an artist with the community. And um, they, their original idea was that they wanted to use a, uh, an old uh, kind of beat up uh, car on the top of their bike stand. Uh, but the neighborhood just well, they weren't really interested in that concept. So they, they had to kind of adjust uh, what their um, concept was. And so that was really pivotal uh, when, when I the kind of rela uh, later uh, related to how I considered looking at my work as well. So we were encouraged to explore uh, our first semester, and uh, I was really interested in uh, the craft traditions and kind of learning those, and I found myself really uh, inspired by the tools that made those things. And I had this really uh, immediate uh, relationship uh, to working with my, with my hands as a means of making uh, and, a, and as a means of thinking. And so the idea of thinking through making um, I think is, can also be applied uh, in more of an academic sense as well. Of course, there was this really interesting irony that I was going to this craft school, yet certain things that I wanted to learn I didn't have access to at the school. And oftentimes we found, as the students, we found ourselves finding these craft traditions through YouTube. And I think that, and I learned how to make the specific uh, net, and I realized I needed to actually make a tool to make that net. I learned it all online. Uh, and so there's a lot of conversations about this weird relationship to the preservation of craft traditions online compared to uh, through this academic sense. Uh, I started, you know, when I was making these things and, and uh, had that relationship to tools, I um, started to kind of ponder where that, where that relationship came from. Uh, and I really, I think it kind of comes back to uh, my relationship to my grandparents. This is my grandfather, Art that's about. He was a machinist at Bendix Steel. Um, and I didn't know, you know too much about his work when I was younger. But I, this, is, uh, this is a little shot of me with my grandfather. And evidently at an early age, I had an interest of how things were made, how things were fixed. Uh, my uh, grandfather on my mom's side, uh, uh, he, I always remember seeing him fixing this tractor outside. Um, the tractor still exists today, and it still is running. Uh, he's no longer with us, but, um, but there's something, this, this kind of really interesting thing, I think, that's happened with my relationship with them uh, that has allowed me to admire um, the the value of their work and the value of uh, continuing to, to, to fix things and keep things running. Um, I've uh, even fixed this tractor a little bit as well uh, since living here as well. So I, so I really um, wanted to continue uh, playing around with this idea of tools, but perhaps using it as a way to um, somehow work with community. I didn't quite know what that meant uh, and for a little while. So I was making these almost like strange uh, devices with tools that um, uh, more or less like Ruth Goldberg machines that would get um, a group of people to do a very uh, simple task using very complicated methods. Uh, this was uh, one of the tasks was perhaps to drink coffee. So I created this like um, uh, this amount of random uh, materials, uh, all made out of steel. I started playing around with more of the actual uh, you know, physical properties of uh, tool handles. And, uh, and essentially, it was me who was orchestrating this. Uh, and I would uh, you know, get people to fill out a bunch of suggestions, put them in a bowl. 
they got to draw it. And this one, I think, was actually uh, turning on a light, or screwing on a light bulb, maybe, was one of the tasks. Um, I also kind of played around more with uh, uh, this relationship of, uh, of doing almost kind of these team building exercises with this particular um, these devices. But one thing that I knew about this is that it, I still uh, had this relationship to nature and relationship with our impact on that. So I didn't quite know how that all fit in with my, uh, my environmental concerns. Um, also, I started realizing that I was mostly the, like my, I didn't think that my artwork existed um, on its own. Like, I was also needed to tell people what to do with the things that I made. And so I didn't know if that was really quite what I, the direction I wanted to go in. Uh, simultaneously, I was working with um, uh, a couple of nonprofit organizations in Portland. This one's called Be Paved. Uh, they were uh, really interested in uh, breaking up uh, a lot of these wide open spaces of asphalt, uh, big parking lots. Uh, and they would then go in and plant, uh, plant, um, you know, plant, <laughs> uh, and and really work uh, the ground so that way it would be um, a lot better. Of you know, not only are plants good for the environment, planting more plants, but also the, one of the issues with uh, huge open areas of asphalt is that they um, there's no area for the water to drain off into, uh, and it just goes right into the, to the river without it being uh, filtered. Uh, Portland does, uh, in some areas, they do a really great job of, of kind of respecting nature where it exists. You know, this is, a, I think, a prime example of not cutting the limb off this tree. Instead, they built the, the building around it. Um, there are instances where the, the nature, uh, where trees and things like that have kind of grown past the capacity of, of the containment that the uh, city has put it in. Um, so I think that was kind of also uh, in the back of the mind as well. And I think that nature has the ability to also, um, you know, if we didn't do anything to it, it would be able to heal itself. Um, another uh, organization I worked with in, in uh, grad school was the Portland Fruit Tree Project. Uh, they had a really great um, uh, philosophy and uh, partnership uh, with um, private land owners, essentially homeowners. Um, and their philosophy was that they, uh, or more so a reaction to a problem, is that uh, usually a fruit tree uh, or several fruit trees is way too much for one family or one person to be able to harvest all the fruit. And oftentimes it would go to waste. And so what they would do is, um, uh, as a group, they would come in uh, with volunteers uh, pick all the fruit, and half of it would go to a food bank, and half of it would go to the volunteers. Um, so I was really inspired by what they were doing. And all of this was happening, these interests of tools, and this, these relationships to these nonprofits, and then this happened. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> this artist block that, um, that crept up on me, because I realized that uh, I am interested in talking about uh, the problem with our consumption and uh, and the mass production, produce mass production, uh, and and how much stuff is in the world, and at the same time I'm a maker and I'm making more stuff, and I, I got to a point where I was like, like what am I actually, what should I even be making or should I even be making? Uh, I I kind of doubted the fact that I needed to make anything. Um, and it really uh, took a while to figure out that it wasn't, uh, I realized that I'm always going to be a maker. Humans are always going to be makers. And really what needs to happen is we have to figure out um, uh, how can we change the why and the what and the how of what we're making. Um, Tanya Bruguera uh, is an artist that talks about um, uh, different ways of thinking about what we're making uh, in her introduction to Arte Util. Useful art is a way of working with aesthetic experiences that focus on the implementation of art in, soci in society where art's function is no longer to be a space for signaling problems. 
but the place from which to create the proposal and implementation of possible solutions. This really kind of struck me that you know, maybe, maybe the things I was making, uh, they were definitely talking about the issue, but they weren't necessarily solving the issue. And I felt that perhaps there was a way that I could even do more. Um, so I, I think I, I finally figured it out. I was going to uh, work uh, with one of these nonprofit um, uh, organizations, and I started uh, to to um, collaborate with the Portland Fruit Tree Project. And one thing that I noticed about them is like, well, if I want to work with them, like as a maker, what is it that I'm supposed to do? And um, one thing that I noticed is that they're really interested in being hyper-local, uh, super sustainable, um, but the one thing that they are doing is they're using tools that are not speaking that same language. Uh, oftentimes, if their tool that they're using uh, were to break, they would just throw it away. There was no system in place that anyone uh, knew how or could fix the tool. And also, the other issue around this is that uh, it's cheaper to buy a new one than it is to fix it. Uh, I was looking at, uh, you know, a, a handle for an axe or a handle for a shovel is more expensive than the actual shovel, much less the time it takes to do it. So the system itself, uh, you know, the idea of the village blacksmith, um, where someone can take their, um, you know, things that need to be repaired, just doesn't exist anymore. And part of it is because that we, uh, our culture is uh, a very much a throwaway society. Um, the system is already in place for us to easily discard it. So what I'm really interested in doing is finding ways to make uh, tools for them that were um, to be able to last longer, but not just the tool, uh, it was also um, a, a system in place to help them uh, know how to repair it as well and, and maintain it for a long time. And in some ways I was really interested in um, uh, making the tool that also helped them do what they do even better. Um, so I worked with, uh, you know, there was a, a bit of a learning curve. I learned how to do forging and how to do uh, wood turning to make these. Uh, I also worked with them in a way that was uh, trying to understand what they needed. I didn't want to just offer them a shovel. And they did actually have a, a, a demand for a lot of hand trials and cultivators as a way to um, uh, get ready for the spring planting. So uh, not only did I just want to make them tools, I also wanted to, uh, to be able to see their, react the, their interaction with them and how they used them. So I was able to do different case studies and put them into action. Um, and I think that part of this experience um, uh, was specifically about the not just the tool, but also the relationship as well. And that kind of goes back to some of the things I learned earlier on in grad school, of how does this relationship exist and how can it be um, in a way that's not just me uh, saying you need a certain thing. Uh, you know, there's very much, uh, I think we've kind of come to realize that uh, the top-down approach doesn't always work when, when trying to work collaboratively. Uh, I called this, uh, this was my practicum project that was called a handle of cake. Um, and I still, uh, I, uh, I, I consider this now um, as more of a case study in working with the community. Um, just a few other images that I'm working. And, you know, it, it was a, when I was able to um, learn more about the processes, I was able to visit, uh, there's an annealing factory in Portland that was able to see the, get even down to like the molecular structure, how metal works, uh, learning how to uh, forge it, how you press it, things like that. Um, and beyond just making the physical object, I also noticed a few other things that they could potentially need help with. Um, they had a, a little bit of a chaotic system of how to organize all their uh, uh, release waivers for the volunteers and clipboards and things like that. So they use oftentimes use these um, these uh, uh, milk crates. So I uh, made them uh, essentially a, a concept or a, a milk crate that would um, incorporate uh, division and places for organization. Uh, 
Um, so part of that, this whole system too, was not just to give them these things. It was also to kind of help educate them in uh, tool repair as well. So I, I offered um, repair workshops. Um, and actually, right as I was leaving Portland, there was a really great organization that just started uh, doing repair cafes, specifically working with um, uh, the communities in Portland to, to fix things. Like, oh, it's right in my alley. Um, one of the uh, artists that I really was admired when I was doing this uh, practice was uh, Deaster Gates. He's uh, out of Chicago. Um, he has his, his artistic practice of, of making objects, but he's also um, uh, well known for his, um, his community uh, uh, work. Uh, this is in the Dorchester neighborhood in south side of Chicago, and he moved there uh, right after he got out, uh, or right as he got a job uh, teaching, and he bought the house next door. And what I thought was really interesting, um, as he was, the house was kind of in disrepair, and he, he began to gut the house to turn it into a, a, a space for art. But he was using the materials uh, and creating artwork from those materials to then fund his restoration of the space. And the, this particular building was, has been transformed to uh, uh, be a space that is housing a uh, collection of Dr. Wax records, which was a local record shop that. Um, closed down, so he was able to uh, have a place for those records, and it was owned uh, uh, by a black business owner, and uh, has a, a, a really great collection of um, uh, music that um, was appreciated by that community. It's a predominantly black community, uh, and the things that he was really interested in, is interested in doing, is that uh, creating spaces that, um, that are uh, essentially um, Catalysts to create conversations uh, around uh, black culture and black identity and the pre preservation of black history. Uh, so he offered uh, uh, dinners and discussions. He, and since the, uh, this first project, the, the, his whole um, one space has grown to quite a few, quite uh, uh, other buildings. And they all do different things. There's, um, uh, he has a place for uh, watching movies. Um, about uh, black film directors and actors uh, and, and so forth. And I really liked how he's uh, working holistically with the community that he's also living in um, and also finding ways to fund it uh, at the same time. Uh, and that is one of the biggest things that I was not able to, to quite reach with my own practice in grad school. I was able to find the solutions and work with the community, but wasn't able to quite um, it would have been nice to have a, a whole other year to figure out how to <laughs> the balance the funding. Um, someone who I uh, really um, admired uh, while I was in grad school and, and today as well is uh, the author Richard Sinnott. And uh, he's written quite a few books, but this is a, these three books are a part of uh, the collection. And um, he's a sociologist that talks about um, this very much in uh, the idea of um, thinking through making. Uh, and essentially, uh, each book is a little bit of a, of, of a different focus. Uh, with the craftsman, he argues that making is, uh, is thinking. And there is an enduring basic human impulse to do a job well for its own sake. Uh, he suggests that there's a, a good craftsperson in all of us. Um, and thinking through making can also connect us to the material things in this world. Uh, but it also can give us insight into dealing with others. And so uh, in his book, Together, Pleasures and Pol Politics of Cooperation, he parallels a craftsperson's ability to develop physical skills as a means of understanding how to effectively promote positive social change. Um, he, he also, uh, in, this, in this most recent book, Building and Dwelling, uh, essentially, I'm, I'm still reading this one. Uh, uh, and I, essentially, what it is is uh, discussing the relationship between the way cities are built and how we interact with them. Um, and so thinking about all, all those things uh, while I was working on this project, um, I think really helped me to figure out a way to work with communities um, uh, that wasn't so, so much of a down approach. 
So right after uh, grad school, I um, was uh, able to be a part of the Glean residency. And uh, Glean is actually a partnership with um, uh, the metro, with the city, as well as uh, with um, Recology. And Recology is, a, is this organization that's, um, they're also in San Francisco as well. And they are working with the city waste system to, um, to find solutions of, uh, to, to recycle more. And I think San Francisco is, at least the last I heard, was around 99% of their waste was recycled. Uh, whereas in Portland, it's about 30 or 40% of their waste was recycled. Um, and so uh, this was, we, we were invited to collect as much stuff as we wanted to at the waste transfer station. And the waste transfer station um, is basically kind of a holding cell before, and, and they sort through all the trash before it's then uh, moved away. Also now I'm officially an artist after they gave me this and uh, it, it verifies that I'm officially an artist now. Um, so it's just a, quite a, a huge, massive amount of material that comes through there every day. Uh, it changes every day. Uh, sometimes trucks will dump off uh, an entire um, household of goods. And you really start to kind of see the history and the people that used to own those objects. Um, and I think what was really interesting is to learn that all that waste was then transferred about 147 miles away through the Columbia River Gorge Valley to the landfill. And to learn that, 100 semis a day transferring that much material really kind of impacted uh, and made me think about um, our, that relationship to waste even more. As I was looking through images for this uh, lecture today, I, there was something weird that happened in my, uh, in my image folder. Uh, sometimes when you take photographs one year and you take them the next year, they have very similar naming conventions, and they're all sorted uh, together. And what happened was this really kind of eerie thing that was a relationship between the Columbia River Gorge, which I visited a year uh, before this, and then visiting the, the dump. So this, all, this happened naturally. So I think in my, as I was working with these materials, um, I think something that happened uh, as I started working with them is that they, they started to build up in my own studio and I was trying to get them out of the way. And I started to, I think I started to try to, try to wrap them together and, and to stick them in a different spot. And through that, I kind of started to notice this really interesting thing happening with, with the wrapping the wrapping of the material. So a lot of the, the pieces for the Glean show uh, became the wrapped and bound together. I was really interested in playing around with the idea of um, all this stuff uh, was being made uh, from, from the junk, from, the, from trash. And we were invited to do a show at the very end of the uh, residency. And um, I really started to think about that relationship that we have with trash and how it uh, now is existing in a gathering space. Um, I think that I uh, started thinking about the relationship to the museum as well as to uh, the gallery. And I, essentially I was making these more or less beautiful objects that were to be hopefully bought by someone else. And I started to become even more interested in this idea of what, what things could be, how far can I push mm -hmm. objects to be revered as precious.
we had to make a lot of work for this show. <laughs> I think it really allowed me to, um, uh, I think we were required to do, I don't remember how many pieces, but um, the thinking about that idea of museum display and kind of recontextualizing our um, relationship to those objects. I was able to visit a museum in uh, California. Uh, this is a, a, this piece, this kind of artifact is, a, is entitled Fruitstone Carbon. I decided to get the postcard because I enjoyed the piece so much. And this is what it says on the back of the postcard. Almond stone, question mark. The front is carved with a Flemish landscape in which is seated a bearded man wearing a beretta, a long tunic of classical character and thick soled shoes. He is seated with a viol held between his knees while he tunes one of the strings. In the distance are representations of animals, including a lion, a bear, an elephant ridden by a monkey, a boar, a dog, a donkey, a stag, a camel, a horse, a bull, a bird, a goat, a lynx, and a group of rats. The latter under a branch on which sit an owl, another bird, and a squirrel. On the back is shown an unusually grim crucifixion with a soldier on horseback. Longinus piercing Christ's side with a lance, and the cross is surmounted by a titulus inscribed INRI, imbricated ground. Which is absolutely absurd. There's no way that that is on this carbon. And, it, and I had to look at this several times. It's like, am I really, I mean, is there any trace that that could actually be on this stone fruit carbon? Absolutely no way. It's just, a, it's just some random thing that they stuck in this museum. And the description that they came with it, I think, is just as absurd as the, of what is actually not on the object. It made me really think about that absurdity and that connection to this idea in my own artwork of putting this trash object into a gallery and, and kind of recontextualizing that value. Um, this artist, James Luna, uh, has, is a performance artist. This piece is called Artifact Piece. And I really uh, am inspired by this work uh, because he's also kind of questioning this relationship um, of uh, museums to civilizations. Uh, this was actually, uh, I think the first time that he did this performance piece was in a natural history museum adjacent to an exhibit about an indigenous people. And so he's there offering himself as living evidence that his, civil, his uh, civilization still exists to this day. And I think that um, what's really interesting about that is that um, there's the absurdity in it. There's also this strange voyeurism that's happening bet uh, between people looking at him and him looking back at it. But he's essentially questioning the appropriateness of what is even being shown in the museum in the first place. And I think that's kind of why I'm drawn to him, uh, because I'm thinking about those very similar themes. I uh, explored something similar, uh, well, uh, in a similar way with this, this piece called Lost and Found. Um, and this, this uh, piece was uh, essentially a series of objects that was um, displayed with very specific uh, hanging devices to those objects. And all these objects uh, were found on the streets of Portland as I rode my bike there. And what I noticed about these things is there's, you know, there are junk, there are junk of trash that are on the side and they're in the rain gutter or they're in the curb. But everything that I displayed in this particular arrangement it still function. It still works. There's nothing that's actually technically trash other than the fact that where I found it. So part of this um, uh, piece was that I actually encouraged uh, viewers to take from the piece if they happen to be losing it, missing uh, that pencil, you know, or a pencil that they lost the week before, right? Um, 
kind of playing between that absurdity and the truth that's that's hidden within it. Within it. Um, I, ha I uh, had this opportunity to do a, well, I applied to do a, a public sculptural piece um, uh, just outside of Portland. And uh, started to think a bit about how I wanted uh, my sculpture to exist in uh, a space that was a bit more uh, on display by a larger audience as well as um, uh, trying to think about this idea of, quote unquote, a permanent object outside, um, especially in that relationship to trash and how things um, exist in the world. Uh, I'm inspired by uh, George Nakashima and, and, and his work, um, and he works a lot with, um, uh, predominantly with wood. Um, and I, I really admire his relationship to, to the, uh, his material. We are left in awe by the nobility of the tree, its eternal patience, its suffering caused by man and sometimes nature, its witness to thousands of years of earth history, its creation of fabulous beauty. It does nothing but good, with its prodigious ability to serve. It gives off its bounty of oxygen while absorbing gases harmful to other living things. The tree and its pith live on. Its fruits feed us. Its branches shade and protect us. And finally, when time and weather brings it down, its body offers timber for our houses and boards for our furniture. The tree lives on. Um, I think uh, when I started uh, considering pieces being out in, in a public space, I was very much influenced by the fact that they are also out in the elements, they're out in nature. Um, the piece I created is transcendent. Um, the physical structure of the piece it consists of uh, galvanized steel uh, as well as uh, raw steel. And uh, hand, I turn the, the wooden forms, uh, which are capped with uh, copper, and they have a copper collar. Very much kind of a, a mixture and melding of uh, my um, graduate program, uh, handle uh, making and tool making uh, in conjunction with the things I was doing, lean. But what I really wanted to, and to explore with this piece is that I purposely uh, uh, made part of the piece uh, impervious to, to damage, uh, while also allowing other parts of the piece uh, react to uh, the elements and the nature uh, that was around it. Uh, anytime you galvanize something, it uh, coats it in zinc, uh, and it will last 30 plus years. Uh, it won't rust or corrode. Uh, but anytime raw steel is exposed to weather, it starts to rust and drip. Um, also, uh, having wood on a public sculpture is not always uh, something that um, uh, that the committee is looking for because it will crack and it will fade and it will um, uh, lose its uh, uh, brilliance over time. But that was part of the thing I wanted to explore with, with this piece. Um, it was uh, the idea that um, this was kind of an homage to the natural world, uh, yet at the same time, nature has the ability to respond. Um, and I also did kind of build in certain things to where there's caps on the tops of the wood so that it, if it does split, it still remains in, intact. It's not gonna completely fall apart. But I expect it to age, and it, and it has over time. It's really nice, and now this piece is in uh, Napa Valley, uh, and. I just kind of did a little touch-up before I sent it over to Napa Valley, and it was really nice to see how it changed and aged. Um, this uh, next piece is actually here in Portland, or sorry, in, in uh, South Bend. Uh, this one is called Unyield. And uh, the, the previous piece, someone, I didn't really have a specific uh, plans or specific form in mind. I was just really interested in kind of continuing that conversation around binding things together. Um, 
as a way to sort of control the, the, the amount of um, stuff in the world. Uh, but it also kind of re uh, references, I think, um, uh, a wheat sheaf. And um, so with that being in mind of kind of what just happened naturally, uh, this piece was commissioned uh, for the person that lives in this house. And they, they responded to my, uh, to my tr transcendent piece. Uh, but I, I wanted to kind of explore um, with this piece specifically referencing uh, something natural that's in this area. And I, I, um, I was looking at cattails as an example. And I think cattails are very much uh, kind of this super plant that uh, all parts are, you can use every part of the cattail in some way, whether it's edible, uh, whether it's for making other things, whether it's medicinal. Uh, so really inspired by what the cattail is, uh, even though some consider it possibly invasive though. Uh, but also this, this piece, um, another kind of challenge was to make it more of a functional piece. It's, it's a railing, uh, so it did have to kind of meet some railing standards. Uh, but uh, but I, in my interest of kind of this exploration around museum display, I was able to kind of highlight that same uh, type of uh, relationship and kind of offer this piece to this place. And it will be sort of uh, on display, but also simultaneously functional. So the last piece I would like to talk about is the piece currently on display in Howard Park. Um, this piece is called Ode to a Cottonwood. And um, the, there was a call for sculpture in the park. Um, and my main priority with this opportunity was to possibly, so I've worked with how uh, nature can influence the public sculpture. Uh, I worked with you know, thinking about things functionally uh, and this one, I'm really interested in making a piece that's like really site specific. And um, one thing that I noticed, I, I visited the, the different plants that they have in the park, and I noticed that there is a really interesting um, kind of relationship of some of the spaces of the plants to uh, a lot of the cottonwood trees that are on the river. And uh, so I came up with this concept to create a piece that would uh, be in direct conversation with the cottonwood. Cottonwoods are, uh, they're really great for riverbanks. They have uh, roots that are uh, aid in river erosion. Um, they are really easily uh, identifiable by the way their leaves flutter through the wind. They have square stems instead of round stems, so they, they have a unique flutter. So this piece is, uh, uh, none of it is uh, bound at the top. It's all loose and can sway with the wind. And also cottonwoods are identified by their deeply, um, uh, the deep uh, bark grooves as well. So that's the inspiration of the multiples of, um, of steel rod. Uh, but one thing that's interesting about this piece is that the, uh, uh, fortunately I was accepted in the show and I'm very grateful uh, about that. Uh, unfortunately, though, my, the main concept was to have the piece displayed in a very specific spot to where if you look through the, the center part of the form, it would also align to the cottonwood grove across the river. Um, and through conversations with them, they love the piece so much they wanted it right in front of the building, <laughs> which I mean, this is great. Uh, so that was kind of... I, I became, it was kind of a balance of, well, should I have uh, more visible space or do I need to stay true to my original concept? And I think the piece still works on its own uh, without it being uh, connected to that cottonwood tree. Uh, but there is a little bit, a little bit of the soul lost. <laughs> Um, but I think the piece, uh, you know, after it's, this, it's up for this uh, show for two years, um, if someone's wanting to buy it, that would be great, but also it can travel to other shows. Um, there's another show in Mishawaka that's on the river, and then maybe that has the opportunity of being connected to the continent. Uh, so yeah, um, 
I think that's kind of all I'd like to say about my work right now. I think that it, um, I'm continuing to look at the environment around me and react in, in different ways. I think that the, uh, there's still a possibility that um, the concept around handle and care uh, could be something in the future. Uh, that's uh, definitely an ongoing uh, uh, thing that I'm uh, inspired by, but it also takes a lot more time to develop the relationship with organizations. Um, and I realize I still need to make things, I'm still an aspire, I have to get in the studio and create. Um, so that's its own thing right now, but I'm able to continue uh, making in different ways. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. 